this meeting. Uh, please make sure to mute yourself uh, if you're not in the meeting or if somebody else is talking. And also, if you have any questions uh, to any of the presenters, please put those questions in the chat window. We will get to them once all of the presentations are done. And now it's my pleasure to invite the last paper of the panel, uh, my colleagues from the theater and dance department, Belincia Hines and Dr. Ras Mickey Courtney. Uh, welcome and feel free to unmute yourself. Greetings. It's 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 Ross Mikey. Mickey is the mouse, Mikey is the man. <laughs> <laughs> so Hello. I'm I'm trying to get um it's not sharing. Um I'm trying to get the it. So I, I, while you're pulling that up, I'll introduce myself. You go ahead and work on that. So we say okay. I am Dr. Ross Mikey Courtney. I am an assistant professor of dance in the Maggie Allison Department of Theater and Dance here at Wayne State University. I teach a number of classes. Um, I'm also one of the co-directors of the Black Theater and Dance Collective which Belicia Charnel Hines is the other artistic director. The Black Theater and Dance Collective houses our two major uh, performance ensembles that deal with Black and Africana aesthetic and social justice themes. The theater ensemble, the social justice theater ensemble being the Freedom Players, which Belicia is, has our logo behind her, and our Africana Theater and Dance Company is Tosangana, which is directed by uh, Karen Prawl, who's also on faculty and specializes in Congolese style of, of African tradition. My area of expertise is in more of modern dance and contemporary dance, as well as within Ethiopian culture. Um, so I engage with Belicia on a lot of projects through the Black Theater and Dance Collective and Freedom Players, as well as with uh, Company Fresh. We've had the opportunity to develop a lot of work that deals with uh, social justice themes. And our presentation today, as soon as Belicia can pull up the slide, uh, do you need, do, should I try it, Belicia? As soon as uh, our presentation today yes, is called. Try, it's not, it's not allowing me to, to open. Okay, I'll try it as soon as, as soon as I tell them what our title is. So our title is Decolonization of the Arts and Altered Perception of Failure. That is the title. I'm going to try and pull up the PowerPoint slide while Belicia introduces herself. Hello, my name is Belicia Charnel Hines. Um, yes, both of us are colleagues in the theater and dance department. Um, um, and he's already said that we are um, co-artistic um, artistic directors of the Black Theater and Dance um, Collective. And I'm assistant chair and associate professor in the department. Um, and, um, and basically our research and what we're doing is more um, um, we are performers. We, what we do, um, and what we're talking on, we have lived it, and um, and we are, um, and we're searching to find better ways to um, to um, to be able to teach theater, to be able to teach dance, and um, um, where it's not just um, um, without having white as just a standard. Because quite honestly, within within all universities, even HBCUs, um, white is is the standard. Um, I attended an HBCU, and we had to learn. We were always taught that yes, you're going to learn the black experience and delve into that, so then you can be proud about who you are. But you need to learn um, the white experience, so then you can survive out in this world. And so, unfortunately, that is something that is always thrown on people. And then, and then on the other end, other races um, don't feel like they have the um, responsibility of understanding our aesthetic. And so um, we've been um, delving into more of how can we have um, an educational system that can delve into all aesthetics. And so then everybody can leave out of um of the educational system where they are um where they are empowered where they are um they have a diverse education and they can do more within this world globally instead of just within one standard so yes thank you dr ross he has it up i don't know what was going on with my computer it is it's probably my computer is like hey it's friday and i'm ready to chill <laughs> So yes, decolonization of the arts and altered perception of failure. So let's just talk about what that title means for a second. 
uh, yeah. decolonization of the arts. One of the things that myself and Belicia have, have really investigated is the usage of that term in decolonization. We have since, since we developed this title, we have since kind of steered away from the usage of that term decolonization because we've come to the understanding that the notion of decolonization is virtually impossible because you first have to recognize what is of the colonizer. And that is a very complex kind of way of looking at culture and identity. So we've since moved in the direction of more of a deconstruction of how we look at identity within the arts uh, and this altered perception of failure. Um, I think reality is perceptional. Let's just start there. So the, the notion of failure comes with an understanding of success. So the idea of success is, is the opposition to failure. So there's this idea of, of a spectrum that exists. But also, I come from a background where my mother used to tell me, there's no such thing as failure, only learning experiences. Uh, she tried, she, she then kind of contradict that statement by saying you, you only fail when you don't learn from the experience. So this whole notion of an altered perception of failure is to look at failure as a part of, of just life experience as a necessity to understand success. We have to know what it means to the opposition of success. So one of the ways uh, and I'll let Belicia introduce this, this some of the ways in which we engage with these concepts in our own practice. <laughs> Okay, um, so yes, so within the Black Theater and Dance Collective that we have within our Theater and Dance Department, um, we, um, we, um, we are developing scholarly work um, um, of underrepresented artists in theater and dance, and we aim to create pedagogical mythologies that will integrate various theater and dance techniques through the lens of the Black experience. And so as directors of the Theater and Dance Collective um, at Wayne State University, we aim to alter the concept of failure into a sensible learning experience by expanding the cultural knowledge of valued aesthetics within the arts. So that's the premise. Now, now let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about this altered perception of reality. You heard me talk about a little bit about the it, it, in the balance of life, all things have an opposition, you know, so perceive the perception of failure versus the perception of success. So these are all perceived things that we based upon our own personal experiences or things that we're taught we're taught. So in looking at how to alter this perception, we have to look at our old thoughts and our new perspectives of these thoughts. So, Belicia. All right, thank you. So, um, Nina Simone says that um, we must reflect the times, that as an artist, it is your responsibility to reflect the times. And so, as you know, right now, today, we're on um, the, um, the um, Derek Chauvin's case of the murder of George Floyd is going on right now. And so reflecting the times of what's going on within this world, as a black person within this world, you know that when you are stopped by the cops, you are going to, and, and I can say I personally had that experience, and I know Dr. Ross has had that experience, you, um, you, um, you, you know, you heed to the commands. You don't sit there and have an attitude because you are thinking about your life. And so within this reflecting the times and these, and all these injustices that are going on and, um, and with, um, with a black man being, um, killed over, um, over for no reason by the police and this being going on time and time again, um, there's this perception that black is bad, black is negative. And so within these times that we want to we use our art to be able to delve into that the fight against that perception that this dark hue is negative that it's scary that it's less than and um and so within this philosophy of the alter perception that um, um that um, that we've always been raised within the fact that unless you are learning things through a Eurocentric lens, then it is failure. If, you, um, for instance, in theater, if you're not learning Shakespeare, then you're not really learning theater. You know, if if you don't like, if you don't succeed in that area. You know, um, um, if, if you're not doing certain things within that white experience, then you're not up to par. And that is just definitely not the case. You know, classical means white. 
that meant, and and it, it does not mean anything um from africa even though uh, um 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 you know the world began in africa so um and so it's um it is only when you don't learn from the experience like dr ross has, um has said is when you actually have failed value in failing so um so with this um, um idea of the value in failing so in this case within america where it's viewed as less than when you're doing other things from the your your um eurocentric experience you know, um, this value in failing, if it doesn't work, why not? Because there's value in it. It's value in learning um, in that. And also in people who are um, who are not black stepping into um, the black experience and learning that if you don't get it, it's okay. There's value in it because just like anything at first, just like a child, when you're walking, when you're tr um, trying to learn to walk, you fall down and then you get back up. And then soon you're walking and there's value in that because you have to learn through these experiences and you'll be stronger for those. Within this country um, um, specifically, there's shame that relates to this failure, that um, there's shame on both ends that um, it, that that sets you up to this perception of failure. That is shame about being the race that you are. It's shame about. Um, um, I know growing up that um, it was a saying that um, um, my mom used to say, she doesn't say it now, but I'm just using this as an example that she said, when you leave outside this house, don't show your color. And and so it had that idea of don't show your color as don't, um, um, don't show your blackness, don't show who you are, because that is viewed as something bad. Because it it um it always was when we, when we walked outside that door, when we go into that school system, we have to act a certain way to be treated a certain way. And if you showed um, um showed certain cultural entities, then you could um you could be kicked out of school, or you will not be given certain um, allowances for certain types of education. So pass it back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to piggyback off of that, um, there, this, the notion of failure in relationship to shame, when you're, when you are living in a system that already tells you that the way that you think you're supposed to live is not going to lead you to success, then you're already thinking of your own self as shameful so there is this this necessity to almost attempt to be someone else that you're not because of the fact that who you are is never fully accepted into these particular spaces so with this perception of failure and this the shamefulness of of being black or of the african diaspora growing up in the united states as a person of color as a black person as an african-american um there are many perceptions that we are indoctrinated with because of growing up in this eurocentric uh institutional system that propagate things like africa being viewed as the dark continent and when you talk about africa as the dark continent dark is given a connotation you know when when you even when you look at to use the bible as a reference there is you know there are contradictions between color and in the bible because all light came from darkness you know everything came from the black and when you look at the the color spectrum or the color scheme and humanity it is said that you know black is the fullness of all light and color and when we look at human evolution we know that all pigments all hues of humanity can be produced by people of color so when you look at the continent of africa africa is not a color if you've ever been there it's not one particular you see all shades and hues of humanity reflected in this in what is referred to by europeans and Europeans who gave Africa this title, the dark continent. And that darkness was to be feared. So as black people, the reason why so much of black culture and African culture has been repressed and oppressed is because there is this natural attachment of fear that's associated with darkness and being black. So growing up with that understanding that if I don't 
change my perception of how I can engage with my environment, then I may be feared and persecuted and become a statistic that ultimately puts me into that category of perceived failure. So as we know, in terms of evolving our understanding and our perception of, of humanity, we know that Blackness is not to be feared. I think that that's what the purpose of movements like the abolition of slavery and the civil rights movement and the hip hop cultural movement and pan-Africanist movement and Rastafarian movement and black supremacy and what we now have today as the Black Lives Matter movement, because that's a continuation of the struggle that people of color and black people have been faced in a, a post-colonial world that we live in. So we've discovered and, and recognized now that black is not something that needs to be feared. Uh, I, I just did a um, curated a symposium and the guest artist mentioned that blackness is something that needs to be honored. And unfortunately, that's not the, the norm of the world that we live in. So in order to alter this perception of blackness and its association with failure and degradation, we need to alter our perception of how we view black as lesser than and recognize that there is value within blackness and it needs to be uplifted and honored in order to get to this place uh, where we recognize a certain uh, equitable value in all cultures within how we learn about humanity, how we learn about um, art in general. So as a young black man, I remember growing up and always being taught that you have three strikes against you already. Mm -hmm. So you are one step away from being in jail, dead, or a statistic of not being successful, not thriving, especially if you come from the type of environment that I came from where I grew up on welfare, I grew up on government assistance and in government housing. So and I was in a predominantly white environment. And so as the black kids who were bused to the white schools, you could tell the difference that a teacher had of you in relationship to your white counterparts. If you were not up to the standard of the policy, they would always let you know it's okay. Why? Because they didn't expect you to succeed. We were, you know, it was, it was propagated that black people's brain doesn't develop as as vastly as people of European descent. We know that that's a fallacy. So all of these types of perceptions, again, as Belicia mentioned, are things that we've lived with as people of color growing up in these environments and how people perceive us in, in this as we as if we are on a pathway to failure and not success, as if we're not entitled to, to have success in our life because of the fact that failure is already attached to our color. So there are waiting for people of color to become statistics and society oftentimes will reinforce the, the, no, the notion of failure to people of color to make us feel guilty about the things that we are doing in an in, in attempt to try and achieve some level of success. So Moving on. Right? Yeah. So, so with all of that in mind, we wanted to work on how can you, how can we delve more into a pedagog pedagogical um, approach within theater and dance with using um, the Black aesthetic, with using the African American aesthetic, with using the African aesthetic. And so, um, so currently in our classes, we have um, used um, used this pedagogical approach in teaching our students. So I focus on a lot of August Wilson, who is um, just very quickly um, a, a, a prolific playwright who wrote a play um, a, um, a play for every decade in the 20th century um, of the Black experience. And so the Yoruba, you know, all the traces um, he um, uses experiences and he uses. Um, 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 ideas and aesthetics from the Black experience to bring out 
um, 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 the stories within these plays. And, um, and so, um, so within that framework, within, um, within my classes, I have used the August Wilson's plays and used the use of Orishas to really delve into different characters um, in, de um, in developing um, these characters and creating monologue scenes and whatnot um, to, to create um, richer um, characters. And so, um, Dr. Ross? And as you can see, the title of this slide is Yoruba and August Wilson and Catherine Dunham. We have created somewhat of, of a spectrum, a continuum, if you will, of the works of August Wilson and the work of Catherine Dunham. And there are two points on this continuum. So we're looking at the work that has influenced August Wilson and Catherine Dunham, but then also the people who have been influenced by and the works that have been influenced by these two prominent figures within uh, African-American uh, artistic performance, performance art. So myself as more of a movement practitioner, I have been exposed and have workshopped and researched uh, people like Catherine Dunham, who again is very much integrates movements and ideologies of our own Orisha practice into her technique, into the Dunham technique. So both August Wilson and Catherine Dunham are drawing from this sensibility about a, a broader sense of their identity that does not start here in the Americas, this place that African, these African Americans were transported to, but it has a deep rooted connection to something cathartic and something spiritual that comes from the continent. And the reason why we use these two particular people to engage with our Africana theater and dance practicum and with our, our ethos and how we engage with our pedagogy is because we are attempting to show the validity of the bodies of work that these particular people created and how they should be equated with the same amount of value as a Shakespeare and the same amount of value as a Martha Graham you know, because their work is just as significant. And in within that black experience that we talk about, these works are oftentimes marginalized and subjugated to being lesser than those uh, European oriented artists that I just mentioned. But what we're questioning is why. The same reason why we question why you perceive people perceive failure as something negative. Because as, as people of color, you know what I mean? Like there's all these catchphrases about when you're giving lemons, you make lemonades, you know, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. You know what I mean? Like all these things about making something out of nothing. And we're making something out of nothing, yet it's still not valued to the upper epsilon and the elite because of the fact that it's not been created with the same fabric that things are created within that space. So we're trying to give validity to these things that are created through a different lens and a different perspective. So that's the reason why we've created this continuum and we look at August Wilson and Catherine Dunham as two integral points within that continuum. So um, what we have done in the past, we, um, as you see behind me, like Dr. Ross said, with Freedom Players, this is our logo. Um, um, and we explore the I Am Project, in which I Am is, is basically a play about one's journey to the liberation of self. The Black Theater and um, Dance Collective explored universal themes of oppression, identity, class, and sexuality. And so all of these students are characters in this play coming from their different worlds, bringing their bringing their race, bringing um, um, what they have um, endured through oppression, um, their sexuality, their gender, um, religion, all of those into this fold, into this circle of all of the, um, the other students and how these things clash within the world. And then within the end, they um, they become liberated because they find within themselves that they, they can still be uplifted even through all of these um, modes of oppression that are um, being thrown upon them with in society definitely and they they have this ability to not then feel shameful 
for things that are a part of their character and their identity that society may tell them is not going to lead them down a path of success. They're able to embrace these things that are perceived failures within their character and view them as learning experiences that help develop their own integral nature of how they can express their individuality. And so going into this year, we explored um, um, a devised piece called Unveiling the Mask. We did two different shows with the graduate students, the graduate actors, and freedom players. And basically with Unveiling the Mask, it was inspired from um, um, from um, Lawrence, not um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we wear the mask. Um, his poem, we wear the mask, it grins and lies. It, um, it hides our um, teeth and shades our eyes. And um, I don't wanna, cause I know time is upon us, but within that hiding who you are, unveiling those things. And so how do we unveil who we are? How do we, um, what are those things that we don't show to society? And we created a, you know, because of the pandemic, we created a virtual piece and the students explore those things that they hide within society and created pieces stemming from that and um and created a story um and um and, and brought those things out so then they can be able to to live their truth um in the past we've um we've performed the production um called it's a play called colored museum by george c wolf and basically it has all just different um, it's like a museum of different experiences in history of the black experience. And, and it's, and it, and it's, it's a farce. It is funny. It has a lot of sarcasm in it. It talks about the minstrelsy era. It talks about, um, going through, um, the times of even, um, the early 20th century. It, it goes, goes through the seventies. It goes through all these, times and and how um how um black people have been stereotyped how they've had to overcome it and and so it 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 talks to um it talks to um black america saying i um let's be proud about our identity and let's not hide it and then also telling white people hey we want to discuss this with you and bringing that out it was very interesting that when this play was being produced at the hillberry theater that 15 percent of our subscribers opted out of seeing it they purposely opted out of um seeing it because they said that it had nothing to do with them because you know quite honestly the, the majority of our subscribers are white and they and and the play had so much to do with them and we wanted a diverse audience we wanted white people to watch it so then we could really have that conversation because we had talkbacks afterwards and so really you know um this when we talk about um deconstruction when we talk about decolonization we're talking about having this conversation with everybody at the table because if if we continue with just black people sitting up in a room talking about the same old thing we're not going to progress um with venus um, um by susan laurie parks this play is about susan bartman um, um and what she contributed um the um the new knowledge that she brought to the larger field in society. Um, it forced all races to step into the black lens of being within a white environment. It showed the lens of the ways of how black people see the um how how black people see um how they've been oppressed by whites. So it gave a different view of you know of that black person being in white society and how what they're going through and and because a lot of times that's been that secret that that has never been discussed um and then also within what we've done in the past within a class called africana theater and dance practicum we focus on Catherine Dunham, August Wilson, and all different intricacies of the Orishas and everything to really delve into the Black experience within creating theater and dance. And so, gonna, so go ahead. I'm gonna push straight through because uh, we're running out of time. So yep. our current research on African aesthetic, uh, we received a humanities a grant and a cultural development grant to do some research um, on how we're engaging with our Catherine Dunham August Wilson continuum. And we received a grant to go to Shango Island, AKA Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but unfortunately COVID shut that down and we were going down to, down. to, to study with uh, Adam Adeola Pascal and to learn more about Oribata technique, which is his technique that he's developed and it's Orisha movement for the theater arts. Yeah, so 
that's what we were planning to investigate by going to Trinidad. That didn't happen. So we ended up doing workshops on Zoom. And we examined the identity of Africana culture and its resistance to an incorporation of European aesthetic. So how, you know, Shango Island is called Shango Island because it was the people of Shango in the Yoruba culture from West Africa that kind of were in this island. But they don't only practice Shango as their main Orisha. They practice all the Orishas. It's just known as Shango Island. So we're looking at how they amalgamated the Orisha practice into what is known as Shango Island, but also maintain the practice in a, in a version, in a way of resisting uh, wholeheartedly diving into a Eurocentric way of living and Eurocentric spiri spirituality. So we explored the basic movements and characteristics of 13 Orishas. Uh, throughout the workshop process, we were able to gain a better perspective of how we can implement this technique within our own ped pedagogues of theater and dance. So uh, we put together a clip um, of the workshop and it'll show you some of the exercises and, and the vocals that were incorporated into how Adeola was uh, teaching us. So we won't, won't be able to see the whole clip because it's about five minutes and I'm gonna cut it short just so we can close out. Yeah, because we only have four minutes left. So yeah. just feel like a minute. The Oribata exercise movement technique helps to start the process of implementing memory, not only in the body, but also in mind, blood, and spirit, which will reflect the philosophy and theory of Oribata when referred to the process of information. Uh, head and drum, mind and body, thoughts and actions. This is done by placing layers of symbolism, shapes, postures, words, songs, and gestures of the Orishas, drawn from their principal elements or movement in dance onto some common basic dance movement and body exercises. Hmm? This also then gives the exercise movement character and identity that becomes unique to Uribata by placing all those different symbolisms and gestures and, well, those are the aesthetics then. Um, through this, we could find and explore information and uh, in somatic meditation, exercise, movement, and voice. So what I'm gonna do is go to some movement Breathe in and out. So that's an idea of of what it was about. This is about five minute uh, clip, so we won't show it all. It's an idea of some of the exercises that he did and some of the explanations that he gave us throughout the process. And we've been able to carry this uh, these this embodied experience uh, through physical expression into our own practice. So we've incorporated our our embodied knowledge into our creative and teaching approaches. Uh, we've also expanded our network of practitioners that integrate the Odisha culture into their techniques, such as Jamie J. Filbert's Kalinda technique. And Kalinda is a dance that also comes from the continent that was another amalgamated culture uh, in Trinidad in the Caribbean. So we will continue to research through field study in Trinidad and Tobago in the summer of 2021. So we're planning to go 
and do the actual field research that we wanted to do last summer, this coming summer, um, to work again more closely with Adeola, as well as with to establish a deeper rooted relationship with Jamie J. Filbert and her Kalinda dance technique. Um, so um, I think we are at time, but um, and so so delving into this, it's like you know, if we fail at it, hey, we have nothing to lose because it's going to <laughs> it's going to help build us up and be able to find different modes of training our um training our performers and training um um training all the students within theater and dance so then they can get um um a more um a broader sense and a more diverse education within the area of the performing arts so, so the last thing that that's on the slide is by seeing failure as a learning experience and as a part of the balance in our perception of success uh can provide a sense of purpose for all experiences so thank you. And now it's time to open it up for questions. Yeah, that's for everybody. And for so everybody, not just for us. I know yeah. it's not just for us. <laughs> thank you. Belin Santok Teros for this powerful presentation. And actually the last statement on your slide is an excellent segue to the questions. Um, I would encourage those of you who presented today to actually go into the chat and check the questions because we're not going to be able to get to all of them, uh, but there are excellent questions about the research that you all presented, uh, some methodological suggestions and recommendations as well. Um, I do have the questions here pulled up, uh, so I'm going to bring them in, but uh, while we still are here, feel free to uh, copy the questions specifically to you. So one question, I would like to start from a general question. That's the question that Veronica Dilat is asking uh, to all of us uh, uh, here on call and especially to the presenters uh, to reflect on. Uh, she's from Wayne State's libraries. Uh, so her question is about learning, right? So that's the last part of the last presentation. Uh, so does learning actually lead to some tangible outcomes or uh, is learning valuable for its own sake? So based on the research that all of you have done, uh, what do we make out of learning? Does learning result in action to correct the problem? And if it doesn't, how can we make it work? I'm going to jump in. Uh, I, I, I relate this to G.I. Joe. Anybody that grew up watching G.I. Joe, where they say, knowing, well, now you know, but knowing is half the battle. So learning is half the battle. You may have the information, but it's the apply, it's the application of that information that actualizes the change. Knowledge is only useful when it's applied. So just learning something is not going to bring about change, in my opinion. Thank you. And as Veronica just pointed to me, the question was originally to Christian, but I'm asking this to everyone. Go oh, ahead. it applies to everyone. And I'll piggyback on uh, what Dr. Raz said and that uh, in many of these government organizations, they fail and they learn, but they may not necessarily change. And that application of what they learned is highly constrained by resources, by other competing policy priorities that they have in place, by, um, by the political will of the community that they're located in. And so that application of the lesson learned um, is, is not always guaranteed. Uh, Patrick or Natalie, your insights? Sure, yeah. Um, I agree with, with both of the comments. Um, additional knowledge is useful, right? Um, it, you know, for the reasons, you know, uh, that Kristen pointed out well in her presentation in terms of being able to use policy failure as a as a way of opening up new ideas about what the fundamental problems are or how government policy is failing or why there's a lack of political action. Um, but, you know, I think that the research that I've done on say these patterns of uh, decline in communities in Metro Detroit and that's broadly more applicable across the Rust Belt, it's a bit of a wake up call too because these are patterns that 
are 90 years in the making. Um, and there's been lots of great research and lots of, you know, really uh, probing discussion about the origins of these problems before um, without a whole lot of corrective action because it takes political will to do something differently. Um, and it takes political will at a broader scale than where the problem is uh, manifested. And that political will has largely been lacking. So yeah, I'm, I'm well aware that it, there's a lot to learn from research like that which I presented. Um, but one of the reasons I like teaching in a planning school is that I get to teach a classroom of people who just keep asking, well, what should we do? They wanna do something about it. They don't just want to go get more funding to study it more. Um, and so that's a useful place for me to always be talking to people who want to translate it into action and policy change. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Natalie? Um, I'll add that because I teach creative writing and the learning in the classroom, I mean, the kind of older method, speaking of decolonization, was always like learn the rules before you break them. But the rules were always on a very particular model um, and usually like a a, a white male writer, say, who made these rules. And instead of a, a thinking of that, thinking of the way that the, the creative writing students are sort of creating their own craft by the things that interest them and sort of uh, fighting against the more, um, the, the kind of uh, bigger narrative of, of that, that they've been taught and thinking, well, how do I want to write this? What is my voice? And how do I sort of create this as kind of the learning as part of the action of creating something in their own, uh, claiming a voice as opposed to like, uh, copying a voice of something that's come before or thinking about different models and things like that. So kind of related, I guess, to, to all this. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. There's certainly so much consistency across all of these themes, right? Like whether we're talking about historical narratives or uh, the colonization and the arts or the natural disasters. And that's actually going to be like one of the excellent segues uh, to the talk that we are going to host uh, in a couple of minutes later today as well. Uh, in the meantime, we can pull up a couple more questions. Uh, I'd like to start from the last question because it affects the students and the broader Wayne States community. Uh, so Lidvas, if you could please unmute yourself and uh, ask your own question, I think it would be best. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I just this issue of shame has been around so long. It's it, it it's just you know terrible. Dubois was writing about it in 1897, and 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 we're still talking about black shame today. Um, white people are creating lots of reasons for black shame. I, I, you know, every day I hear about good schools and bad schools, which makes me crazy. Um, and um, I appreciate um, that that both of you, um, Dr. Heinz and, and, and Dr. Raz, talk about how this hurts all of us. Um, and this is an issue for all of society. And I'm wondering about how your students, black and white, are, are responding to your work um to um broaden what we understand as, as theater and theater practice one of the things that myself and belicia didn't mention is that we also helped to facilitate a reading circle which we reached out to broader university community and shared basic books to help them understand you know the racial disparity that exists in the country looking at white fragility by robin d'angelo looking at all is uh it's all about love from uh bell hooks looking at uh ibrahim kende's how to be an anti-racist and ultimately that was something that we carried over into the semester this year with developing a reading circle group with our students so using this material as the backbone for myself I used it as the backbone of the material for to create a social justice themed ensemble with my repertory. So they read this material, white students and black students and Latin and the few Asians that we had, they read this material and had to sit with it and had to acknowledge their placement within the construct because we all play a part. It's the acknowledgement of the system, acknowledgement of the institution, acknowledgement of the information that you've been taught so that you become aware of what's actually real. And this was a real, um, it was a shift for many of the students because we gave them prompted survey questions 
about their consideration of themselves as a racist. Yeah. In addition, at the beginning of the um, um, semester with my um, lecture, my um, Black theater course, I asked them, when, um, at what age did you realize your race? And so, um, you know, um, I, I saw a lecture about that usually um, white kids, they don't realize that until later. So I wanted to like really ask everybody and see, you know, and especially because I have students from different places and 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 really it proved that even some of the white men they didn't even realize their race until they were even asked that day <laughs> so i found that really interesting whereas the black students or really the students of color um who lived grew up in america that um they realized it er early on that something happened when they were young that made it really clear who they were whether it was on tv or in life or whatever and so to be aware of that and, and to be aware of your privilege or lack thereof and be aware of of these things then we can begin to have a conversation instead of you sitting around in denial mm -hmm. We've even had revelations from black students, though. We had a oh, black, yeah, yeah. black student from Macomb County that did not really understand her blackness until she started to work with myself and Belicia. She never really had to think about it because she grew up in an environment where there was nobody like her. So she was more concerned with fitting in. And that's a testament to most people, not even just people of color, but anybody who's an immigrant to this country. You know, and I have two sons that were that immigrated here from Ethiopia. Their sensibility about fitting into the American system has changed a lot in the past four years of us being here. When they mm. first got here, they were like, I'm me. You know, I'm going to be who I am. Now it's like, oh, but my friends, you know, so there, there, uh, there's a lot of revelations that happen on both on all spectrums. Thank you very much. I can certainly relate as an immigrant myself to that last message, right? Uh, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I'm going to bring up uh, one last question. And by the way, if you're willing to stick around at the very end of the conference, uh, there is still time build up uh, to discuss the remaining questions from this part, as well as anything else that will emerge between now and the end of the conference. Uh, so please uh, uh, know that we will get to some of the questions that remained unanswered. But the question that I'll bring up, it was actually a question to Christian, because there is a lot of people who are interested in learning and successful learning and examples of successful learning. But everyone else here, uh, Natalie, Patrick, and others are welcome uh, to add uh, their insights about that as well. Uh, so the question, the question was from Robert, uh, could you give us a few examples with names of cities that have learned from disaster? Uh, so some examples of communities and cities that you discovered that were able to learn. Sure. So um, there are, well, three, three examples from the Hurricane Harvey case. Um, the first was Corpus Christi. Uh, they were the city that developed the, uh, the flooding simulator and really learned how to market that to their citizens and communities that were vulnerable and then have pressed those communities to press the city council to change, change the building code standards and the land use standards. Um, so that would be one example. Um, Galveston, Texas is another example of really proactive learning. So every time they, uh, they have a significant rain event or they have a hurricane, they assess their, um, their flood zone mapping and they are so sophisticated in what they have learned about flood risk and flood risk management that they can identify areas that will be subject to repetitive flood loss um, and be able to identify them when they are when they've experienced enough repetitive flood loss so that they can um, they can request funding from FEMA or from HUD to, to buy out that land. And they've like instituted like really interesting things like no wake zones in, uh, in, in business districts where cars can drive down a flood street and push all this water into businesses, creating all kinds of unanticipated damage. So, um, so they've gotten really good at that. And the, the city of Houston um, really uh, did a big pivot uh, in the time after Hurricane Harvey, the um, Harris County and the city of Houston put out this big bond measure um, to shore up uh, uh, rainwater spill off and drainage and all of that and flood control in the city. 
and it was pitched as like a, an issue that would, uh, or as a bond issue that would benefit suburban counties, not just the city of Houston, but the, uh, the uh, Harris County got a new county judge, which is like a county CEO, COO, our equivalent of Warren Evans here in, in Wayne County. And that county judge pivoted and said, nope, we're going to take all this bond money and use it to low income African American communities in the city of Houston that have been subject to continuous repetitive flood loss for decades. So they took a real and they were very upfront about saying we're going to take a social justice um, and an environmental justice uh, approach to how we handle this. So so they so Houston is kind of amazing. Like they learned politically to get a bond pass and then they learned about environmental justice um, at like and did a big shift to that. So those are those are three really good examples from the natural disaster field. Thank you so much, Christian. And it's perfect to end uh, on this optimistic note, the first part of the conference. And thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we will get back to the unanswered questions, either uh, individually or later. Uh, it is welcome everyone who just joined us, including the keynote speakers. We are, however, at the time of a short break. Uh, so feel free to take a five minute break and we will come back after five minutes. Hi, Alicia, and hi, Shailen. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? I <clears throat> Sorry. Am I, is my speaker okay? Yes, it's excellent. Great. Great conversation. Oh. I wish I'd been there for the whole preceding yeah, conversation. I wanted to jump in on Galveston, actually. I know the Galveston story. Well, well, how about you, sir? Right? I'm, I'm honored by your presence. Thank you very much. Hey, you guys, it's good to see you. Uh, Professor Aronson, if I may. Yes. <laughs> Glad I'm, to see you face to face. Indeed. indeed. Um, and I hope you'll call me, despite my pretensions, I hope you'll call me Bob. Um, yes, Bob. <laughs> yes, I've even, I've even um, going to put in a question in chat as soon as you start. And you'll recognize some of the thoughts behind the question to both Bob and Sherilyn. Sherilyn, are you here? Shailen. 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 I don't see you. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Gl glad to hear from you this afternoon. Yes, you too. Um, uh, is it Ronald or Ron? Ron. Um, and uh, I understood from Alicia that, Alisa, that you're going to be um, Asking the first question, is that what you're putting in chat or is that a, or is there- a, I'll, put it in, I'll put it in chat so you can, you can be forewarned. It, it, it'll be familiar to you. I'm, I'm really concerned about this issue of um, the, the relationship of uh, racism to the rejection of the growing sense of community. Yeah. Um, and um, it's something you bring up. Uh, and um, Heather McGee has written uh, a whole book about in her own very different way. Yes, I, I, I know that book, I've read that yes. book. Yes, yes, So, and, and I think she's got a particular point. You quote Mary Jackman about it, which I think is, is useful. The way in which people become individualistic I find it absolutely remarkable, people becoming individualistic in order to shrink the sense of community in order to uh, not admit everyone into the community. Hi, Ron. Ron, Hi. how are you? Hi, Harold. How are, every, right. how are you, Walter? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, why don't we keep the keep the questions until the question time. I will, I will. I can't resist. I've been, I've been so engaged with Bob, with Bob and, Sh and, so and Shailen's book. To, to meet Dr. Putman, I, he, he, um, he had a run through with my staff yes. yesterday and I didn't have a chance to, to, to greet him and thank him for, for agreeing to, to do this um, 
for, for thank him for, for agreeing to do this keynote along with uh, Shailen Romney. So my name is Walter Edwards. I'm the director of the center and I, yes. I'm pleased to welcome you to our campus and we're looking forward eagerly to your um, presentation. I'm sorry, because I had a meeting yesterday, I couldn't join, I couldn't join you and Shailen and Lisa for the run through, but I heard that you had a quite lively session. So we look forward to your um, presentation. We had a very lively session and in, in the end, it worked out extremely well. So I were, your staff was great. And uh, I'm, Shailen and I are really pleased, uh, very looking forward to this a lot. And Ron, if I can say to you, um, uh, whether you ask your question at all, or whether you <laughs> ask it in the chat line, I'm speaking also to Elisa, uh, or whether you, whether you come on air, so to speak, and ask it, the question of uh, racism and the relationship of, of our book to, to racism in, in, in the, between the relationship between race and our, our basic argument is absolutely the very first question we would prefer to have asked. Good. <laughs> as we've said to Alicia. So yes. there are, there are um, I would say almost logistical reasons why we prefer to, and this is what we'll do, we'll talk about race Shailene will talk about race as part of our standard presentation, but then um, I think the way we've agreed, it just works out this way better is if she ends her talk. And then the first question is, is about race because that's where we want to go. It's Good. the reason we want to do it that way is because the book itself, although as you know very well, we talk about race uh, in the book. The book is not a book about race. So no. that's why it's helpful to us to begin providing the larger overview first, and then in response to a question, yours or, actually it's funny because yesterday with Elisa, we, we said we wanted to be sure somebody asked the first question about race. So it's gonna, it's, it's working out great. <laughs> and, That's terrific. And the other, the other issue you, you raised in your review of our book, and I think you know this because we've talked about it, uh, which is agency, is exactly what Shailen and I will uh, want to talk about we probably won't we'll talk about it maybe at the end of the or toward the end of the q a but i assure you we will talk good here off about ra about agency because that has become um, a big part of our presentation and, and i'll just say finally which you know uh ron but other people may not know the book was finished and at the publisher um in january of 2001 so the book itself and the authors of the book knew nothing about the pandemic. They knew nothing about the economic collapse. They knew nothing about Black Lives Matter. They knew nothing about the politics. <laughs> they, they knew nothing about, they didn't know who was gonna be the, they, didn't, they thought Biden was, might be the nominee. They thought Trump right. might be the nominee, but they didn't know that. They knew nothing about the campaign. They knew nothing about the outcome of the election. They knew nothing, nothing about January 6th. They knew nothing about um, you know, the, the State of the Union message, they knew nothing, and they know nothing, and they knew nothing at least about, <laughs> about the Biden um, recovery package, whatever it's called. Um, so it's fun for us, and then I'll shut up because I think probably, Alicia, you want to take control of this. Yes, um, uh, but thank you so much for helping me with the moderation because I think now everyone is well aware of what the structure of this is going to be. <laughs> uh, so just to follow up on that and welcome everyone, welcome the distinguished keynoters. Uh, so we will uh, uh, welcome our keynoters with the presentation for about 30 minutes and then we will have some time for questions. Uh, so we will keep the same structure as we had in the first part of the conference. If you have questions, please type those questions into the chat window. I will work uh, to pull them up and uh, see which of these questions are similar. So we make sure to address uh, all of these questions. And just as a brief uh, debrief of the first, first part of the conference, 
so it's a future of failure and we had an excellent first part of the day where we had four very diverse very interesting presentations uh, spanning the fields of political science urban studies english and art theater art and uh, the the speakers have reflected on four different aspects of failure right from housing segregation to natural disasters and infrastructure failures uh, to the failures of historical narrative to be accurate and to the failure of the canon to be inclusive and uh, you know not uh, to push out the forms of art uh, that are non-white uh, so that's actually an excellent transition transition to the keynote uh, that we have today and of course the discussion that we had after the first part of the conference largely focused on how the failure could be avoided and if it's unavoidable how can we learn from failure which is another excellent transition to this groundbreaking work that we're going to hear about today. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome our keynote today, Professor Robert Putnam and Ms. Shailene Aromni Garrett, who are joining us today virtually. Uh, so it's actually not the first time when Professor Putnam visits Wayne State's campus, although this time it's, it's a virtual visit. But the first visit was in 2016, and he was likewise a keynote speaker uh, during the Forum of Contemporary Issues in Society held here at Wayne State University. University. And if I understand correctly, he was presenting his previous book uh, during that time as well and reflecting on the lessons from that book. Uh, I will start for just from brief introductions. Uh, I'm sure that the book by this point does not need a lot of the introduction and the speakers themselves do not need a lot of introduction, but I would like to highlight just a few things. Um, Robert Putnam is a Melkin Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University and a former Dean of Harvard University. Um, he actually was born in New York, but raised in a small town in Ohio. Uh, he has degrees from numerous institutions, including the Smartwood College, Oxford University, and Yale University. And in addition to those three degrees, he has 18 honorary degrees. Uh, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, past president of the American Political Science Association. Uh, he, in 2006, he received the Skype Prize. Uh, it's the best prize that a political scientist or the highly priced uh, the political science can get. And uh, he worked with many presidents across various uh, lines, including President uh, Obama, who awarded uh, Professor Putnam with the National Humanities uh, Medal, recognizing his contribution to the research on society and the role of humanities in the society. Um, he has uh, written 15 books uh, translated into 20 languages and counting. Uh, and uh, his most famous books uh, to date include Making Democracy Work, uh, the book on Italy, as well as Bowling Along um, on American Society. Uh, before coming to Harvard, and it's an interesting connection to Michigan, Professor Putnam was actually at the University of Michigan. So there is a Michigan connection here as well. Uh, he also consulted various governmental officials outside of the United States, including Prime Minister Tony Blair and Cameron, as well as Prime Ministers of Ireland and Finland. And he also worked with governmental officials in Singapore and South Korea. Uh, welcome, and his co-author today, who is also going to present, is Ms. Shailene Romney Garrett, who is a Harvard graduate herself. Uh, she is a prolific writer, and she is interested in the questions of connection, uh, community, and how we can bring community together, which is the connection to the book itself. Uh, she, uh, her own research is focused on religious communities across the United States and the divides among those communities as well as uh, what that means for the society. She is the founding contributor of the Aspen's Institute Initiative Social Fabric Project, and she has, she's a prolific blogger, she has her own uh, blog project Reconnect. Um, she's also a former Peace Corps volunteer and she's a social entrepreneur. Uh, together with her husband, she has founded the Think Unlimited. It's a nonprofit organization that aims to catalyze social innovation in the Middle East. 
Uh, she has lived in the Kingdom of Jordan for six years, and during that time she worked with Queen Rania to bring an original Arabic language curriculum um, uh, and creativity to Jordanian public schools. Her work has appeared in New York Times, Fast Company, LinkedIn, Harvard Business Review, and Arab Investor. And she is also a prolific uh, TED uh, talk speaker as well. So you can look her up and listen to her inspirational speeches. Uh, thank you very much both and uh, welcome Robert. Thank you very much, uh, Alisa. And um, may I say, first of all, please call me Bob. Um, and I think I'm speaking for Shailene, and you can, should call her Shailene as well. Um, or, or Your Excellency, that would also work, but let's, <laughs> let's stick with Bob. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Edwards, can I thank you for your hospitality? We're, un, we're very honored to be back at Wayne State as Elisa said, um, I do have Michigan roots, actually pretty deep Michigan roots, uh, not in Detroit, but at the University of Michigan, my dad and my mom and my wife and my daughter and my granddaughter was born at the University of Michigan Hospital. So I'm, I'm, and I, and I'm a, a fan of the, a longtime fan of the Tigers and a pretty close fan of the Lions. I don't confess, I confess I'm not quite as close a fan of the Pistons, but that's, I'm sure, my mistake. But I do really, really feel a lot of affinity to Detroit and to the and to Michigan. Um, so I want to talk to you today about this book we've um, just published that I think may be relevant to some of the questions that are being talked at this conference. We very much understand the really fascinating, challenging topic of this conference about about uh, the future of failure. And we'll try to make our remarks relevant to that. If you can bring up the PowerPoint slide now, I can start um, talking through my part of the chart, uh, my part of the talk, and then Shailen will come in partway through. Um, so I don't know whether you're seeing this across your full screen. I'm I'm seeing it as just a a little over to the left, but that that's fine. Um, so this this book. As you can see here is, um, the title is The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. And what we're, um, what we're trying to do is tell a history story. Like much of my work in the past, I'm trying to do really, really good social science, in this case, really good social science and history as an academic. But to do it um, with an eye nor toward not just being a good scholar, I hope I'm that, but to try to change America, because actually I want to change America. And I'm, that's and that's really the first half of this book, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about, is focused mostly on the facts as we understand them. And then the second half, which Shailen will most, mostly talk through, will focus only more on the lessons that we can learn from this history, because we think they're highly relevant to actually what's happening in Detroit right now. That's the strong claim we're gonna make. So we have the next slide, please. Um, this is just our starting point. It's a true fact. I'll show you the pictures in a second, the graphs in a second. America today has reached, judged by our own history, very high levels of political polarization, very high levels of economic inequality as a separate matter. Thirdly, as a at least apparently separate matter, very high levels of social isolation. And finally, very high levels of self-centeredness culturally. And so the first question is, how did we get here? And then the second question, which we'll talk about really more in detail at the end, which is, how do we get out of here? Um, so I'm going to show you some, some statistical pictures. We have the next slide. I can sort of show you, walk you through this one in a way. All these slides are going to have the same um, shape and point. The horizontal axis in all of them is going to be time. So over there at the left-hand side of the chart, you see uh, the end of the 19th century, we're going to be talking, that's where we're going to, our history is going to begin in, um, at, the, at the end of, of, at least at an important point in the Industrial Revolution in America, and a period which historians call the Gilded Age. Uh, why they call it that, I'll get to in a second. Um, and over at the right-hand side, we have today, over at the very far end, you see 2020, or even we could talk 21, 2021. Now, not all of our graphs will go there, but it turns out that all of the underlying 
all of the underlying trends continue from past 2015 to, to where we are right now. So, and the vertical axis is gonna be one of those four dimensions I talked about, politics, economics, society, and culture. And um, we're gonna see how did politics or economics or whatever go up and down over the course of this 125 years. So let's talk through this one. You can see as the 19th century was ending, American politics was extraordinary polar, extraordinarily polarized. And, and polarized means down in this case, way low. Actually, as it turns out, we'll talk more about this later. Probably America at that point was the only period in American history up until that point in which we had been as politically polarized was the five years from 1860 to 1865. So you can see this was, we were then really polarized. Um, but then coming out of that period, you can, here's where the, the data begin to be clear. In the first couple of decades of the 20th century, we began to become less polarized and more cooperative across party lines. Comedy is a sort of old fashioned word to talk about. The state people were working about, um, worrying more about how they um, could solve problems together and not about just their partisan differences. Underneath all the graphs I'm gonna show you are lots of hard individual indicators. I see a question in the chat line that wanted to know how to, how to measure this. I can't now go through in all detail all of the underlying statistics. I don't have time to do that. But here, for example, we use measures like to what extent do uh, people cooperate across party lines in Congress. Uh, and that's changed a lot. Sometimes there's been a lot of cross party collaboration. Sometimes there's been very little. And at the beginning of the 20th century, there was very little cooperation across party lines. But we only also do things like um, split ticket voting. How often do voters, um, uh, 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 how do they, how do often do they split their ticket between uh, voting for, say, a Republican for one office and a Democrat for the other office. And that also turns, shows, turns out to show exactly the same trend. Or we can look at trends like, what is the approval rating of a given president? To what extent do the partisans of the president, let's say today, um, to what extent do uh, Democrats approve President Biden compared to how Republicans today view President Biden? As you probably know, there's a huge difference. Republicans hate I'm exaggerating, but most Republican voters are really unhappy about Biden and most Democrats are very happy about Biden. That's a mark of a very polarized society. And that was also true back in the, back in the day. Um, so that and other measures we put together and they all turn out to show the same basic curve. Um, we look at things like uh, to what extent do people, how do they feel about their children marrying a Democrat or Republican? Lots of other measures. They all show the same picture and, and if you'll, if somebody wants to push me further on the data, I'm happy to do that later. But the basic point is there are many, many measures. They all tell the same story. And so we've just put them together. Um, and that now to go quickly through that chart, you can see that beginning in the, um, the early years of the 20th century, we began to be a little less polarized politically, a little more cooperative politically. And that trend continued with a few ups and downs, but basically steadily upward through the 20s and 30s and 40s and into the 50s, let's pause up there at the 50s for a second and oops, stop up in the 50s, the middle of the 50s, the, the very highest peak up in there was, um, that's the period in which Dwight Eisenhower was president. Now, probably a few people watching this, I mean, on this, in this discussion group, remember Eisenhower, but Eisenhower, all historians agree that Ike was the least partisan president in American history. Both Republicans and Democrats tried to nominate this guy to be president. It was a mark. Um, it, it, it's George Washington was a little less partisan than he, but but uh, Ike was a, and it was not that Ike caused the depolarization. He was a perfect symbol of the depolarization, and that continued for a little while. But then, as you can see, suddenly in the 1970s, that begins to go downhill, um, less and less. Um, cross-party collaboration. All these measures show this steady decline and more and more polarization steadily through the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s and 2010 and into the 2020. And in fact, here's a case where if we, can, exactly, if we continue this graph further, we now know what happened after 2015. It hits, it's way lower. And it's, and so what it turns out is today, that's the, that's the reason for saying today, not only are we more, more polarized than we were back in the Gilded Age, we're almost as polarized now as we were in the, in the Civil War. So that's not just rhetoric, that's a statistical fact. Now let's go quickly through the other 
the other three dimensions. Here we're looking at economics. Here we the actual hard data only begin in 1913 because that's when the IRS was created and, and, and we begin to have really seriously hard data on income distribution. And when the data, when the curtain rises on these data, America, that's why it was called the Gilded Age at the end of the 20th, at the end of the 19th century, the Gilded Age, there was a big gap between you know, the robber barons, you can see, you could see it in on the on the east side of Manhattan, the upper east side of Manhattan had these wonderful mansions of the robber barons, you know, Rockefeller and Carnegie and all the rest of them. Uh, JP Morgan, they were all up there in their big mansions and barely 10 miles south on the lower east side were the huddled masses. I mean, the original huddled masses, the, the poor Folks from rural areas, mostly illiterate from, from you know, Russia or, or Italy or Poland or whatever, that was the gap. That was the distribution of, of economics and of well-being in general at that turn. And you could see that's what happens. I mean, here the data don't go quite back that far, but you can see when the data, when the curtain rises on these data, we can see we're very low in economic equality. But then again, it, pretty soon in the 20th century, right there, we begin to be a, we begin to have a little more economic equality. There's a little bit of a pause during the 20s. That's simply the, the, the roaring 20s, the stock market gains that accrued to the rich folks up on the lower east side, I mean, the upper east side of New York. But then coming out of the 20s, even before the, the depression began, suddenly we began to have more economic equality. And that trend continued steadily upward. You can see through the 20s, through the 30s, through the 40s, through the 50s, um, and into the 60s, uh, stop for a second up there. I'm not saying that America was perfectly equal, of course, in, the, in, the, in that period. There we were, you know, there were, there were people, there were rel more wealthy people and less wealthy people. But at that point, by way of international comparison, America looked like Sweden. We had the same distribution as Sweden did in that period. So we were very equal. But then Pretty soon we began to have less equality. And as you see, especially after 19, after in after the 1970s, plunging levels of equality, or in other words, skyrocketing levels of inequality. And this, this side of the chart is actually better well known. Most of us know that there's a growth of inequality in recent decades, down through the 80s and through the 90s and so on. And it looked for a while like in the mid 20 in around uh, you know 19, 2013 2015 it looked like maybe we were finally ended with this but actually once again if we could we know what happened after that and if we continue this graph down in 2020 it hits that's where we are we're way down there we're even lower less equal than we were in uh, at the beginning at the in the gilded age and and maybe less equal than ever in American history let's go quickly to the next slide. The, uh, this is a measure of social cohesion or what I in some earlier work called social capital. It's a measure of the connections that people have with one another, the connections they have with their communities, with their families, with their friends and neighbors. Um, and um, during that period, you can, and, and as you can see, all by all those measures, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Americans were uh, quite disconnected uh, from their, their community and their neighbors and their even their family. Even at that point, um, lots of people never got married. And if they did get married, they were called spinsters and, and bachelors. Those were old fashioned terms. Um, but many people were like that. And many people, and if they got married, they got married late. And if they got, if they married at all, and they had, they had very few kids or fewer kids. Um, so all those measures were very, of social networks were very low in that in that at the end of the 19th century. But once again, we see that in the early years of the 20th century, we began to suddenly have more connections. Didn't, didn't change overnight, of course not. No big, big social change occurs overnight, but gradually year by year, you could see we were steadily becoming more socially connected. More of us getting married, more of us trusting other people, more of us joining um, labor unions, more of us joining churches, more of us you know, joining the Rotary Club or all sorts of community organizations, more of us um, getting married and having kids and, and um, more of us trusting one another. And you can see steadily upward, there's a pause in the 20s, sort of like the, the pause in, in the 20s for the economics, but then it continues going up in the 30s and in the 40s. Pro this is probably the greatest civic social boom in American history. Every year, more and more people going to the PTA, more and more people um, you know, joining garden clubs and, and more and more people getting married and having kids. Of course, that's the baby boom. So everybody's getting married early and having kids. And then suddenly in the late 60s, 
suddenly it turns and we start being less connected with other people by all of those measures, less trusting, less, um, uh, less, you know, less uh, well-constructed family units. I'm not talking about whether there's a marriage license involved. I'm just talking units uh, were, were less, became less, people became less interested in forming permanent unions. They less likely to join labor unions, stop going to church, all of those connections, stop trusting one another, down, 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 down until we hit now back to a very low level of social cohesion, about as low as we were in the earlier period. So let's have the next slide. This is a slide about, um, what am I doing? I should probably get done here quickly. Shailene, you should be reminding me that I need to shut up and get, get back to the, the narrative. But again, social, uh, here we're using a lot, a lot of measures. I won't take time to talk about them now, but I'm actually most proud of the the statistical underlay here, we're trying to measure the degree to which Americans thought of themselves as a connected, as a connected community, what we could call a we, or in, instead, whether we thought of ourselves as individuals. And in the early period, American was highly focused on self-interest and narcissistic culturally. Um, but then again, you can see as the, as the 20th century opened, we began to become a little, a little less focused on the I and a little more focused, a little more focused on we. And that trend continues steadily during the first years of the 20th century up during the teens. As you see, there was a pause, the same old pause in the, in the 20s, but then out of the 20s, through the 30s, through the 40s, through the 50s, hitting a peak in 1964, that's the peak. And suddenly we begin to become suddenly less focused um, on what we have in common and more focused on what divides us and what's in my self-interest, more and more focused on me, me, me. And that trend continues downward, downward, downward. Um, just pausing for just a second about, about contemporary affairs. Um, uh, Trump comes onto the scene, Trump is, a wonderful example of this I, he, you know, the I alone president, that's what, that's what he was symbolizing. But he's not the cause of this. You can see very clearly here, he comes into the story very late. And, and the basically the problems that Shailene and I are talking about, these long-term problems that you can see very clearly, they did not begin when Trump entered the White House and they will not end, these problems will not end when he leaves the office. Of course, we're all concerned about the fact that he's out of the office and we hope he doesn't get back into the office, all that's true. But what I want to focus on is that the bigger picture we're looking at is not just about Trump. And we, and, and in order to get to that, in order to pivot toward another we, which is what we want to do, have a pivot now, of course, we got to get there in the short run. And that means worrying about what Biden and the rest of us do in the short run. But in the long run, it's not, we're looking about the long run, not just this short run. So let's have the next slide. This is pretty simple and I'm about to hand this over to Shailene. I just here, just put all those four graphs together and you can see what you already knew. It's the same chart. These are not, America during the 20th century was not one set of trends about economics and a different set of trends about politics and a different set of trends about society and yet another set of trends about culture. It was the same trend. It was this, what we now call the I, we, I society. And if we have the next slide, we just put them all together. Statistically, this is actually pretty simple and pretty powerful. I'm quite proud of the math underneath this graph, but it's not the math that I want you to look at. It's that, look at that trend. You can see there the laws in the 20s, but it's a pretty simple trend. And, um, and now I wanna turn this over to Shailene so that she can talk about, first of all, the larger meaning of this I, we, I trend. Maybe we should go back to that previous slide because I think she, if we could go back to, Shailene's gonna talk about this slide uh, she's going to talk some about this slide, and then she will get on to what to the really the PowerPoint, the power powerful point about what we mean to be saying here, which is what do we learn from history? Shailen. So you know, I do think it's it's worth just pausing to note how really breathtaking it is that all of these really disparate trends track the same trajectory over such a long period of time. I think that um, you know many of these trends are known to experts within each of the individual fields of, of society, politics, culture, and economics. But I, I think it's lesser known the fact that they all really look the same over this period. Um, and so, as you know, as Bob started his his discussion, he noted that we are really in a multifaceted crisis today, um, and and 
you know, we're not the first book to ask the question, how did we get here? There's been a whole genre of books over the last decade that have really taken on that question and tried to answer it in different ways. Some of them look at one particular trend, whether that's economic inequality or a, a descent into cultural narcissism. Um, and, and many of these books, also, but there are very few that I think recognize the interbraided nature of all of these different trends. So that's one thing I think that makes the story of the upswing different. The other thing I think that makes the story of the upswing a little bit different as well is that most of the books that are asking the question how we got here are focused on this downturn, this half century or more in which America has been on this downward slide. And, and narratives such as that tend to have a, you know, a bit of a um, looking back to a golden age type of uh, narrative, uh, a make America great again sort of thesis. And we really want to take a, a moment to emphasize that that is not actually what we are advocating for. We don't, even though this graph has a clear peak, a clear peak when America was at sort of the highest sense of we that we had accomplished over this period, we don't necessarily think, we certainly don't think that that was the highest we could have ever gone toward we, nor do we think um, that that was a, that that was a time in American history where there were no problems. Clearly there were many. However, um, we do think that this curve is very instructive, mostly because, you know, not because of what we can learn from that peak moment, but what we can actually learn from the moment when the last downturn gave way to an upswing. Because what's so interesting about this statistical story is that when you look at the hard data, the, the multifaceted crisis that we are in today is not new. We have been here once before. This previous period at the turn of the last century, the, during the Gilded Age, when the Gilded Age gave way to the Progressive Era, America was in just such a mess, the same kind of mess that we were in today. And similarly to today, there were doomsday prophecies about how democracy had gone off the rails and everything was lost. But on the contrary to those being fulfilled, we entered, we engaged in a pivot and entered a multifaceted upswing that lasted for decades. So the question then becomes, how can we emulate that last upswing? What are the lessons that we can learn from the period when a, a determined group of reformers came onto the scene and really set in motion a sea change um, that helped us get moving in the right direction again? So if we could go to the next slide, what I wanna do is just highlight a few of the lessons from this last upswing. So, I want to pause for a moment to just clarify, we are going to be speaking about the progressive era, but we're not using the term progressive as it was used as it's used today. When you look at the term progressive today, we might call that small p progressivism, which describes the leftmost end of the political spectrum. However, when we're talking about the progressivism of this era, of the progressive era, we're talking about capital P progressivism, which is a different type of use of that word. The progressive movement from this, um, uh, this bygone era was an extremely diverse coalition of people. In fact, historians have called it so diverse as to be barely coherent. Um, there were a lot of competing factions within it. They didn't always agree on what, what the agenda was. Um, but this was a group of people that had a compelling desire to repudiate the downward drift of the nation. And they were united by a galvanizing belief in the power of ordinary citizens to do so. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about progressives. Now, a lot of times when we tell this story, again, because it's a statistically based story, people will say, well, what was the leading indicator? Um, what that means is, what was the trend that turned first? If you can identify what things started moving in the right direction first, maybe you could identify what a silver bullet was that sort of brought all of these other trends with it. Was it economics? Was it culture? Was it, was it um, social solidarity? And a lot of times I think, um, social scientists in particular assume that the answer to that is going to be economics, that economics was the thing that drove everything. I think Bob might even admit that when he came into this study, he assumed that that would be what the answer would be. What's so fascinating is that the data clearly show that economics is the lagging indicator. We actually started to fix um, that gap between rich and poor last. Um, and, and that's quite clear from, from the timing of when, these upturn, uh, when this upturn began. So if economics is not the leading indicator, what was the leading indicator? Well, that's a little bit hard to say. Again, we're looking at scores and scores of data sets here in order to tell this story. But it appears when we pair that data with the statistical record, it seems quite clear that actually it was a moral and cultural shift that led this upswing. 
So just to give you a, a, a bit of a historical sense of what was going on during this period culturally, um, the Gilded Age was a period that was characterized by something called social Darwinism. This was um, the idea that um, Darwin's theory of the survival of the fittest, which he articulated to describe the biological world, might be a great way to organize society. Now, Darwin himself did not subscribe to social Darwinism. It was um, that concept was sort of imported by others into the social sphere. But this was the idea that only the strong survive, that society is just a giant competition, right? And, and you know, it, that's, that's the end of the story. This is a good way to organize our society. Um, and into that, and that's, that's the cultural milieu that produced the robber barons, right? That sort of winner take all mindset. And onto that scene came a group of reformers that actually came out of Protestantism. Um, that began to question that cultural narrative and say, you know, I don't think that society is one giant competition. Isn't it about what we owe to each other, about taking care of the most vulnerable? Um, and and these, this movement was called the social gospel movement. It really was a movement that was not just about identifying the bad apples in society and expelling them, but rather um, the historian Richard Hofstadter described it as a movement characterized by moral indignation directed inward. Many of the progressives were chastened elites, elites who began to realize their own complicity in exploitative systems. And so that um, moral and cultural shift uh, really began to change people's thinking about how to organize society, which had effects on how we began to rethink economics and politics and other things. So that's one really important lesson here, that if we're looking to, to, to see another upswing today, we may need to pay more attention to repudiating the hyper-individualism that is currently characterizing American society and think about what a new morality and a new value system would be to replace that. Another lesson here is that this was a really youth-driven movement. It was young people who were out doing the innovative work um, to change the cultural narrative, as well as to be sort of in the neighborhoods, in the tenements, in the, in the municipalities, um, tinkering with new ideas. The people we tend to think of as the leading progressives of the day, you know, Jane Addams, we often think of them in their older years, but they were doing their most important work largely when they were under the age of 30. So we believe that the post-boomer generations are likely to be the ones who lead us into another upswing. These were also reformers who were very focused on association building. That's a term that might seem a little antiquated today, um, but we might use the term connection or community or relationship today. But these were people who understood the power of bringing people together. And, and they viewed that as both an end and a means. And what I mean by that is, as Bob uh, noted from the data, we know that this was a time that was characterized by loneliness, deep social dislocation. People were actually experiencing an extreme um, uh, demographic shift with the Industrial Revolution, moving out of small towns and farms and into big, busy, commercial, anonymous cities, and they were feeling really dislocated. So there was a strong sense that there was a need to invent new ways of bringing people together, just as an end in and of itself. But what these reformers began to realize was the power of creating social capital. They didn't use that term to describe it, but they began to understand that there was power in bringing people together. And the progressives did not work across all lines of difference, which is something that I will address a little bit later, but they were working um, largely across lines of class difference to bring these um, very disparate classes into communication with one another to create a sense that we were in this together. Um, so that was a very important feature of this and also, uh, you know, something that we think will have to be central to the efforts of reformers today is inventing new ways to bring people together. Um, this was largely a grassroots movement. Uh, there was no um, national blueprint for the progressive movement. It was something that started in the laboratories of democracy, in, in small towns, in neighborhoods, uh, and, and there were people really translating their moral outrage into citizen engagement. They were reclaiming their individual agency in the face of a time of dizzying drift and, and complexity and saying, you know, we have the power to shape the future and we're gonna start working on it right outside our doorstep. And that's exactly the prescription that we would offer to start another upswing today. 
Speaking again of leading and lagging indicators, charismatic leadership was a lag. There was no one sort of um, leader that came onto the scene and said, you know, this is my vision for America and everybody got in lockstep behind them. Again, this was a sort of big, messy grassroots movement that sort of found what worked and those solutions then bubbled up to be met by um, national political entrepreneurs who managed to fashion these grassroots initiatives into national programs that achieved bipartisan appeal. So one of the ways that the, po the political polarization of the day was overcome was by working more locally first before moving into that national sphere. Um, so we've, we've highlighted a lot of points about the great things that the progressives did to, to, in, to sort of encourage this new upswing. But not all of the lessons from this era are positive. And we do highlight several of them in the book of sort of the cautionary tales that come out of the progressive era. I don't have time to go into all of them, but I will just say the biggest one was that the progressives themselves were racist, not entirely, but largely, right? And so the we that they were working toward, their circle of moral concern was simply not inclusive of people of color. Um, one way I'd like to describe this is sort of they they sort of kicked down the road the need for racial reconciliation as though that was something that could be put off for later. And the result of that is that we that they sort of built into a lot of their progressive reforms, the systemic racism that we are now um, reckoning with today and really have been reckoning with for the last 125 years. And so any upswing that we would hope to see today has to take full inclusion. Um, as its central tenet, as its motivating force, building a we that is fully inclusive because the we that we built toward last time, though it moved us significantly in the right direction as a nation, was certainly insufficiently inclusive. And so um, in a way it contained the seeds of its own undoing. And again, we, we may have time to talk about that in detail a little bit more later. Uh, if we can just go to the last slide here, I wanna leave you with this thought from uh, Theodore Roosevelt, which is this. The fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others, is that on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. Whether we believe in the power of we, whether we lean into that or not has changed over time. But as a result, and I think what is really interesting about the data in the upswing is that it shows that, you know, the more we lean into the power of we, the more the, the nation moves in the direction that we hope it would. And the more we back off from that, uh, the more we see things begin to unravel. So our hope is today that we can reclaim the promise of we, that we can fashion a we that is fully inclusive in hopes of initiating another upswing today. So we're really looking forward to whatever questions um, can come out uh, from this very you know, intelligent and engaged group to see uh, what more we can tell you about this research today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bob and Shailene. Uh, the invisible round of applause uh we actually have uh, a great deal of questions and it's interesting that questions more or less parallel the chapters in the book so for those of you who haven't had a chance uh, to read the book yet i would encourage you to do so uh, so we have some questions about race war and global influences gender cultural solidarity social capital and some of this um, broad strokes that the book addressed and uh, thank you so much by the way for answering my own question about culture versus structure debate uh, in the last part of your talk uh, so this was amazing um, so we will start from the first question uh, and i'll ask uh, ron aronson to unmute himself and ask his own question go ahead ron Thanks, I think I'm on mute now. Um, and I'm concerned with the, the downswing and the remarkable reality that, well, we know the downswing isn't over. Um, we're watching it um, unfold uh, alongside of which may be the beginning of another upswing in terms of a sense of community and a sense of solidarity but the to me the real question of the book as i as i've gone through it is how do you explain the downswing what is the reason why america has really fallen apart that's what those those graphs show uh even though they're 
it's it's from an intellectual perspective it's it's wonderful to see the way they overlay and i was as enthusiastic as you were to see that but it's also very dispiriting to see the a graphic representation of what many of us have lived through sure. we lived through that downswing and the you, you consider in the last chapters the various factors and i want to focus on the one that I think is most salient and have you comment on that, which is race. Mm -hmm. What was happening in the 60s, a number of things, you take the 60s appropriately as a turning point, but what was happening in the 60s, um, I would say um, uh, above all was a challenging of the racial order that had been part of America up until that time. So the we that developed a sense of community was developing uh, an increasingly uh, solidaristic society was developing as you describe it of white people. And it was challenged very sharply in the 60s. And, and now I'm thinking of the question, what happened that the society and those in, a pos in positions of power turned away from that increased sense of solidarity and community. And, right. and, and you, you, you know where the question is going. I do, I do Ron. And I'm going to actually let Shailen talk mostly about this. Good. Uh, just because in our division of labor, um, uh, she, she drafted the uh, chapter on race, although I, of course I'm not disavowing it at all. I, on the contrary, I, I helped to contribute to it. But I want to instead step just to start a little bit with a broader framework, and that is the 60s. I'm not going to talk all about the 60s because we have a whole chapter, as you say, about the 60s. But what you need, what everybody needs to remember, and it's not always remembered, the six. There were two parts to the 60s. Um, one, um, the first half of the 60s, um, up until roughly 1964-65 was actually a period of, of accelerating emphasis on what we had in common. It was the culmination. I mean, really, in fact, in living it, it was a culmination. Ron, you're too young, but I actually lived, that's when I was coming, I was in college in that period. And so I remember it, but I'm not just relying on my own recollections. All historians agree about this, that there are two 60s. The first half was a culmination of the fact that we're all in this together and, and that and people were rejoicing in that, not accidentally, the civil rights movement occurs as the culmination of that long, that long upward thing. It's not that the, the and Shailen will say more about this in a second, but it's not that kind of um, uh, Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement came completely out of nowhere. That was the represent, that was a culmination of this long emphasis, increasing emphasis on we. However, and here you're certainly right, and you know that we agree with you, in part, in part because of the civil rights movement, the second half of the 60s, I don't mean the civil rights movement intended this, but there, there was white backlash to the civil rights movement. The second half of the 60s was a very different 60s. And um, uh, I'm having now an Alzheimer's moment about maybe somebody in the room will remember me. There's a, the classic history of the 60s actually is years of hope, days of, days of rage. And that book is about the first half of the 60s, which were the years of hope. And then the days of rage put us down and, and by the end of the 60s, we were in what uh, Tom Wolfe called, we're now back in we, uh, in I. That's what he said. So this is not just us after the fact seeing this change in the 60s. People living through it felt the, um, the, the, that transformation. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot more to be said about the 60s, but as, we, as Shannon already said, we think that the focusing not on that pivot, but on the earlier pivot is much more instructive, but except for the issue of race that you've raised. So Shannon, why don't you pick up there on the issue of race, which is of course, we all agree very crucial here. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's important to remember that the, the fragile national consensus around widening the we to include people of color had been built over that long period. The civil rights movement didn't come out of nowhere in the 1950s. There was a long civil rights movement that had been, you know, asking America to make good on that promise for decades. And they and and that had succeeded over time in creating a scenario in which the vast majority of Americans were in support of the civil rights legislation. However, 
we know that as soon as the civil rights legislation was implemented, there was a very strong, not in my backyard response to the Johnson administration's efforts to redress racial inequality on the ground in actual lived experience, right? And so, so, Amer so white Americans were very supportive of um, widening the we in principle but not very supportive of widening the we in practice. And to me, that's an indication that America had done the legal work of racial reconciliation, but had not done the heart work. There had not been a sufficient focus over these years of actually, you know, um, thinking, you know, thinking through and feeling our way through what an actual we looks like. Now, there's a lot more to say about race. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, I do have a, I, I, I would like to present some data for, for what the sort of broader story about um, trends toward racial equality is here, because uh, there are some surprises. So if it's okay, I just want to um, share a little bit about that sort of bigger picture um, now. Um, it is easy to look at the 20th century and think that the story about um, racial progress looked like a hockey stick. What do I mean when I say that? Well, um, it, it's easy to look at the, uh, at the 20th century and think, well, for that first two thirds of the century, there was basically no progress toward equality between the races, right? And then in the wake of the civil rights legislation, bam, everything changed. I think that's a common view that a lot of Americans, particularly white Americans have about the 20th century. And it's important to point out that on measures of inclusion, that is an accurate story, largely, particularly when we're talking about things like, um, political representation or white supremacy in the broad culture and in the media, when we're talking about the long delayed entry into professional schools and jobs. Um, this is a story that corresponds largely to the story of, of residential segregation. So that hockey stick narrative is actually accurate for, for measures of inclusion. What surprised us when we looked at the century long data, however, is that that story doesn't actually apply quite as well when you look at material equality. So what you're looking at now is a graph that measures trends over time toward or away from um, black white material equality. So you'll see that on the x-axis, we've got our same time horizon and on the y-axis, uh, we move up to 1.0, which represents full equality between the races. Very clearly, we have never gotten anywhere close to full equality between black and white Americans. And I do just wanna pause to say, the reason that this is um, only comparing blacks and whites is because we only have data um, for these two groups over the full time horizon. We don't have groups, we don't have um, the same type of data for, for other groups of people of color over this period. It's it's not that their story is as unimportant. It's just that we can't um, we can't look at it um, longitudinally in the same way. So what you see here actually is something a little surprising. Before 1970, and particularly in that 1940 to 1970 period, was the fastest movement toward material equality between the races. Again, we're talking about really important things here, like life expectancy, infant mortality, education. Um, earnings per worker, measures of wealth, such as home ownership. The greatest progress toward equality between the races was actually made before the civil rights legislation, which I think is a very surprising story for most white Americans. Not surprising for most black Americans because this was the contours of their own genealogy, largely driven by the great migration. Black Americans standing up to claim their place within the American we by migrating out of the South and into places where they could access education, own businesses, vote, etc. What's also surprising about this, however, is that in the wake of the civil rights movement, as I've already explained, you see a complete leveling off of progress. We would expect to see that after we dismantled de jure segregation, this already upward trend that we see from 1940 to 1970 might have continued to get closer toward equality. On the contrary, on many individual measures, progress actually reversed. On many other measures, it completely stagnated. And so what's fascinating here is this stagnation of progress and the turning point in the stagnation corresponds you know, eerily closely to the moment when America flipped from a we direction to an I direction. Um, we can't say that, you know, white backlash to the civil rights movement caused the broader cultural turn toward I, nor can we say that a broader turn toward I caused the white backlash, but we do know that these things are intimately correlated. There's no way to talk about America turning back toward I without talking about race, which I think um, is exactly what Professor Aronson is trying to bring out here. Um, 
So I, I, I think there's some, some surprises here when we look at the trends, but there's also just the lesson that the backdrop to the Black Lives Matter movement and the calls for rac racial reconciliation today are not just about police brutality, obviously, they're about very measurable stagnation um, in terms of progress toward equality and the fact that the civil rights movement did not bear the fruit that it promised. And for many white Americans, this is a surprising story. It's likely not that surprising to those people on this call, but it's something that we wanna highlight for that reason. Shannon, just, just add two sentences more about the Black Lives Matter marches last summer, because they're directly relevant to everybody here on the, on the call and also to this chart. Yeah, I mean, I just think that the deep sense of frustration and having had enough is illustrated by this graph. I mean, we're talking about a half century of complete stagnation in terms of material equality for black communities, right? And so there is just a sense of enough is enough. I think a lot of white Americans think, oh, well, you know, we did that civil rights movement thing, like, and 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 things got better since then, right? The reality is that they did not get better. They did get better in terms of inclusion. Again, those measures that we that I started out talking about, but they did not get better in terms of equality. Inclusion and equality are not the same thing. And so Certainly the work is not done when it comes to inclusion, nowhere near done, but I think we've done better on inclusion post-civil rights. We've done terrible on equality as this data clearly illustrates. Thank you very much. We are now going to shift gears a little bit to some of those other questions and aspects that resonate with the book chapters. Um, so one of the people on call are bringing in the question of gender. So this is a question by Elizabeth Hawk. So Elizabeth, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask that question, that would be ideal. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your, your presentation. I, I guess I'm, and I see all of these things as, as, as connected. I, I, I just, I'm having my hard, a hard time wrapping my head around the idea of a we um, that is so exclusive. Um, and, and, and it just seems like one could reverse your curve and say, you know, that as women make progress, as, you know, Blacks very slowly make progress in this country, as GLBTQ people make, you know, progress, that's a much bigger we for me than a we that is all defined by white people. And so I, I, I just, I, I, I see this, this, this pre-1968 we as being so exclusive as to not be a we. Um, and, 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 and I think that that kind of diversity then creates tension, but I'm not sure that it's, it's, it's individualistic. It, it, it seems to be a much broader sort of notion of what we are as a nation when there's more space for difference than there was up till 1968. Um, Shannon, can I take a crack at this first and then yeah, you, you jump in? Um, Elizabeth, may, may I call you Elizabeth? I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't actually even know what your professional title is. Um, and do call me Bob. Um, so, I very much respect and understand, I think, the position, the, 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 the historical interpretation you're laying out. Um, and it, but it isn't the same as ours. And so let me see if I can indicate what our perspective is about that set of questions. Um, and I may not convince you, but I want you, at least I want you to know what our view is. Uh, we've already said what we think about race, actually, we think that the evidence, I mean, Shailen laid this out very clearly. We do not think that race was solved. For good and sakes, we don't think that race was solved. We do think that progress was made toward a more inclusive, racial, more, a more racially inclusive sense of we, including, at, including on the, the part of whites in that earlier period. And actually we also, as she said, strongly reject the view that, the, you know, the hockey stick view that most of many, Indeed, most white Americans have the hockey stick view. Nothing was done until the civil rights movement, and then we solved it. I don't say you hold that view. Do you recognize that other people hold that view? That's the, that's, we're, we're trying to speak to them saying, you know, far from fixing the problem, we stopped fixing the problem in, in, in the, in, at the time of the civil rights movement. Um, but anyway, Shailene has laid out what our view is. You may not agree with the fact that we think there was significant progress uh, on, toward racial greater racial equality, not necessarily toward inclusion as Shannon made clear. And, not, and we make clear very far from, you know, very far from equality, but the trend we think was in that, surprisingly in that direction. Um, 
gender is a quite different story, actually, and um, I'll try to be quick about it. Uh, and I'm, I'm don't, I despair of being able to convince you just in two minutes of things you hold deeply true. But if you look at the statistical measures, the short version, it's not just us that say this, this is actually lots of people, including lots of female scholars. Um, help me, uh, Lisa. Uh, 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 primarily the economic historian, um, Claudia Golden. Right, exactly. Um, the, the 20th century is a century, and actually it goes back before the 20th century, of steadily, of a steady closing of the gender gap in almost all spheres of life. Um, it's, it's, um, it was not the case, as it was the case of, of a race, that somehow the 60s triggered a backlash against women. It didn't, actually. Indeed, if you do similar charts to the one that we showed you for race, what it shows is virtually every year, women are narrowing the gap, the gap between male and female in earnings, the gap between male and female participation in the labor force, the gap between male and female um, education levels. Indeed, the education, for the whole damn period, women have been getting more education than men on average, and that's been increasingly true. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. It's not true of, um, of um, entry into professional schools. That is, the fraction, the relative role, of, the relative frequency of male and female lawyers, for example, or per college professor does, does change over this period. And of course, I think college professors and lawyers are important, but that's a tiny fraction of, of the total story. So if you're talking about the total story for women, and there's another minor exception, but it's, only, it's a minor exception, which was during the decade of the 1950s, because of the, of the World War II and, and many women deciding, deciding themselves actually to have kids, there was a, a stasis in the, there was a pause in the upward movement of women. And that's the period that, um, help, um, uh, Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan wrote about. And so a whole generation of women, it's my generation of women, sort of believe that Betty Friedan came in and that changed everything. Actually, historically, that's just not true. I'm not trying to say Betty Friedan was not important. It's historically, it's not true. She so was responding story, to a pause rather than a trend that had been going on for a long time. Right. And so I maybe said more than I need to. Um, believe me, I'm not arguing that women should be back go back in the house. My, my daughter is a college professor. I'm extremely proud of her. And I would be pissed as hell, frankly, that's technical language, if, if, if things were reversed or not even allowed to go forward further. She's really talented. And I think that's true of a lot of guys, actually. Got a lot of guys my age who really became liberated in this term, in these senses, because they know their daughters and their daughters are smart. And that's the case for me, at least. Um, now there's a, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long, but the question you asked is actually a deep question. And there's, a diff, there's another question you asked, which is actually not the same thing, which is diversity. Can, is diversity um, incompatible with um, community? And as it happens, you will know this, I've actually written a lot about that subject. Um, and, and I'm not trying here to try to trot out all my research uh, that I've ever done, but it is actually relevant because uh, in 19, uh, in 20, I've forgotten something, 20, 26 or something like that. Um, uh, I wrote an article about that question and I reported and the, I did it on the basis of data and it's, and the data turned out to be true and I'm, and it's been vetted scientifically and I still believe it, which is that the short run effect of diversity is to cause everybody to hunker down. That is everybody to hunker down, not just whites. In the face of unexpected diversity, Americans, um, not just Americans, actually it turns out this is not just unique to America, kind of pull in. And in my jargon, that's it, it low, lower social capital, but that, and, and um, white racists who read that article love to stop right there, frankly. And it, if you stopped right there, please don't. But if you stopped right there in reading my article, then you, you end up with, with my being uh, on, the, on the website of the, of the Ku Klux Klan. As the white guy says, racial disparities, I mean, racial, you know, race mixing doesn't work. That's absolutely not what I say because the second part of what I say that the white racists always ignore is what I said was, but over time, a successful immigration society, a successful society who's good at 
assimilation, I mean assimilation in the, in the proper sense, changes that. And America did. You can look at the data in America. As it, as, by the time that the second generation, I'm now switching a little bit to immigration, but it's the same kind of question. I mean, I can talk about the same, make the same point in terms of race, but I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. It's all, this, all this story we're telling you also applies to immigrants. By the time that the second generation of kids, immigrants, back then it was the second generation of immigrants were the second generation of, 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 um, of Irish, I'm not Irish, Italian and Jewish immigrants during that period. By the time that the second generation um, came of age, it turns out not accidentally, that's the 60s and that's when we open the doors. That's when we open the doors for the, for the, um, for the, to immigration with the immigration reforms and not accident that that all that happened it's not an accident that the civil rights movement and the opening of the doors for immigration occurs at that peak of that period and then of course i'm doing now the well i won't go into the rest of the history it, i what i would go on to say is that same story that i just told about you you know you take into account applies to the second half of the of the 20th of the 20th century but and i just for, forgive me this is just a personal thing the white races began using my argument to defend, to, to attack affirmative action. And so I, my article was used as a leading part of the, of the case of the people who were opposing affirmative action in the Texas case. I'm sorry, I've now forgotten the Texas case. And that gave me the chance because they used my, my to, I filed a, the, C, the NAACP invited me, and I was eager to do this, to file an amicus brief. So I personally was arguing to the Supreme Court against that. And, and in fact, the NAACP won. I'm not saying it was my doing, but I was actually there at the time. And what I'm trying to say is, I've been a little bit trying to defend my own personal uh, record here. Rem bottom line, diversity in the short run is tough. It's actually tough for all of us. And everybody on this, Everybody in the in this who everybody in the here who knows worked on diversity all their lives know it's not simple. It's hard, and it takes time. It takes time personally, and it takes time socially. And, but in and, the long run, if you if you work at it, that's the kind of idea about agency that underlies our work. If you work at it, in the long run, you can change that. I don't say it's guaranteed. We nothing is guaranteed, but we tr are trying to say that, and we are also trying to say just the last point that we did work at it, not perfectly, but we did work in the right direction the last time around, and we can do that now. I'm sorry, Elizabeth, I went on so long at you, and I don't know if I persuaded you, but that's, and I'm sorry, Shailen, I used up too much of my the time on that response. Well, well no, I, I just would like to add one thought, which is to just, to, to thank you for bringing up, Elizabeth, what I think is actually a really important point here, which is, and I often like to quote Eric Liu, whose work you might be familiar with, he runs Citizen University out in Seattle. He says, you know, we are trying to do something that's never been done in the history of mankind, which is build the first um, multicultural mass democracy, right? And so it's not like America is just doing this, America is fumbling through this bad, through something badly that's been done before. It's that this has literally never been done before, right? And so I, I agree with you in saying that, you know, up until this point, the, the defining of the we, the defining of even Americanness has largely been led by white men, right? And, and that has produced a certain type of idea about we that we need to bring everybody else who's not a white male into. And that's not necessarily an effective thing to do, right? Um, and, and so uh, my hope lies in young people of color, particularly, who have been excluded from that conversation up until now to actually lead us in the moral redefining, the moral awakening and the cultural and values redefining that's going to be the impetus for this new upswing. So I, I completely agree with you that, that we have not solved the question of how to define we in a multiracial, multicultural society. We've not done that well. Our attempts to work toward a we have moved us in the right direction. Has it, have it, they moved us fully, entirely? You know, no, which is why I think there's a real opportunity here to learn from what the progressives did right, but understand that as a society, we have never done the defining of the we right yet. That is something that remains for future generations to do. And, and that's our hope. 
thank you very much, everyone. I'm noticing that we have run out of time. Uh, I would like if the presenters are amenable to bring in the last uh, sort of question uh, and bring in a little bit of a global perspective, uh, if you still have a couple of minutes. We do have a couple of minutes. There's an important question that was raised earlier that we've not had a chance to talk about, which Ron raised, but it's implicit in a lot of other things, which is the question of agency. And I hope, I'm happy to answer any other questions. I, and I know you guys have got to get on to other things. Actually, I've got a little more time, but I, I know you've got to get on to other things. I'm just asking, can we reserve another couple of minutes after we ask, answer the question about, or try to answer the question about the global environment for the question of agency? It's a really, really important topic. Sure. Uh, so the global question or sort of a global-ish question, right, is by Rex uh, Lamour. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, the question is uh, whether to move forward and to achieve unity, we need a good war, right? So what's the role of wars and conflicts and things like that? And Rex, if you would like to unmute yourself and uh, correct me in case if I didn't ask that question correctly, feel free to do so. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, I'd like to draw the question on uh, the global yeah. internet uh, yeah. as an impactful element of whatever future change might occur. If we look back, we didn't have global internet. We look forward, we have global internet. How will that change the factors that might bring about this upswing? Shane and me or you? Uh, you go ahead and then maybe I'll just I'll just bring us home with some comments about agency. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I also want to talk about agency. OK, um, now I'm sorry. The questioner has disappeared from my screen, so I can't be actually uh, looking at him. Um, so let me ask. Yeah. Hi, Rex. I'll, I'll try to answer very quickly because we're all busy, uh, but I'm going to try to answer both the questions. One war. Um, um, the short version is there is a you can see in the data a little bit of the effect of World War II. That was a it was a significant effect, but war cannot possibly explain the curve. Okay. And the reason the reason is the curve is going up toward more community. Um, long before there was, I mean, thirty years before World War II, okay. um, and um, uh, and it kept going up for 30 years after World War II. And so it's hard to imagine that if it was just war, there'd be a spike upward between 1940 and 1945, roughly speaking. But it doesn't look like that at all. It's been, it was started going up in the 20s and it's stopped going down. I mean, it's, it didn't start going down until the 60s. So that's not a story. War doesn't explain this. Well, no, it's the common enemy. World War II had the war, but then we had the Cold War. Which yeah, was the Rex, common... forgive me for interrupting. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want. To, I'd like to respond to that too. But if I start responding to every of your of yeah. your follow ups, I won't ever get done. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. will only say, in the book, we talk a lot about the Cold War, and that also it's is the Cold War important? Sure, I lived through it. Is that does it solve this problem? No. And I now I've got to talk about. You want me to talk in sixty seconds about the internet, um, and and so I'm going to do that also very quickly. You know, I followed the internet a lot um, because it was raised after I wrote a book called Bowling Alone 25 years ago. And I described the collapse of bowling leagues among others. And at that point, the social media did not exist actually, but shortly after that they were invented, Facebook was invented. And at that point, everybody said, we don't need bowling leagues. We could just, we could just use Facebook. Facebook replaces bowling leagues. And so I spent a lot of time over the last 25 years wondering if that's true. The short version is that it's not true. And for a long time, actually until I would say last Thanksgiving, I had a tough time persuading people that face-to-face -face was actually better than virtual. Now, that question has simply disappeared from all of our, our uh, discussions. Why? Well, do I need even to say why? Hugging grandma is different from Zooming with grandma. I've got seven grandchildren. We it's true, we Zoomed, you know, we Zoomed for, for satyrs. We Zoomed for, over this whole period, we've Zoomed a lot. And I can assure you, it's not the same thing as hugging my grandchildren. So that's the short version. There's a slightly longer version and it's gonna transition, Shailen, to you and, and, um, and agency. 
One thing that we you can see in the area of the of the internet, and I I'm sorry I'm I'm trying to summarize pages and pages and pages in you know a minute or two. One thing you can see is that people often ask, um, well, what is what are the effects of the internet? I mean, what's technology going to do to us here? As if technology determines this all. It's all de technologically determined, and you invent you know as if who knows what the tel radio, what the effect of the, the television, of the telephone was, who knows what the effect, but it's all technology driven. That is not true. And this is the main point I wanna say. We're not, our lives, our use of technology is not controlled by the technology. It's controlled by us. And I'm gonna speak really briefly, but if we wanna, if we want an internet of cats, we can have an internet of text. We can all of us collectively choose to watch cat videos and we'll get an internet about individual watching of cats. But if we want an internet that can be used to build community, then we need a different, then we can choose and our choices will we work through the marketplace and it'll lead the, the folks out in Silicon Valley to produce a different kind of internet, namely an internet that has focus, uses the internet to make it easier for us to make connections with our neighbors. And there are, there's a program called Nextdoor. And Nextdoor is an internet technique designed not to replace face-to-face, -face, but designed to enhance face-to-face. -face. It's a kind of an alloy. It's a mixture of face-to-face -face and, and real. And the alloy is even better than either of them taken separately. So my main point here, and I, there's, there's been a 20th, 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 20th anniversary of Bowling Alone just, just published now. There's a, if you really want to go into the depth, there's a last chapter of that book that is focused only on the question, is Facebook as good as bowling leagues? And the answer turns out to be no, it's not as good as bowling leagues. A lot of the subsequent things I'm trying to say here are in that chapter. So if you really want to you get that second, second 20th anniversary edition and read the last chapter. But, and I'm now going over to Shailene, the lesson of, of, that, of that whole story is we can get the kind of internet we want. It's up to us. We have agency. Does that make sense, Rex? I've... Over to you, Shailene. Yeah, and that agency doesn't just work through the marketplace. It also works through legislation and other things, right? And so, and then what we call for in terms of regulation of things like social media. Um, and that certainly was true of the progressive era. And just to hark back to that progressive era, because again, that's, you know, that's the point of this book is to, is to not call on the progressive era as a, as a template that we should just take wholesale for today. The, the issues are different. The technologies are different, but nonetheless, that was a period in which there had been a huge shift demographically technologically, culturally, economically. And the response to it was to be in crisis and to, and to, and to be despairing about what the future hold, held. And yet, in the words of Walter Lippmann, a, a, a critical mass of people did not succumb to the drift that could have been sort of a despairing drift in response to those shifts. On the contrary, they grabbed the reins of history, engaged in a process of mastery that set us on an upward course for decades to come. Now we've already discussed the way in which that, that their form of mastery and their vision for what was possible for America was myopic in extremely important ways that cannot be denied. Again, the legacy of which we are dealing with today. And in, and in many ways, the upswing that those progressives set in motion, as I said earlier, had knit into it the seeds of its own demise. The fact that they did not engage in racial reconciliation at that time meant that, you know, the upswing ultimately became a downturn because we didn't do that underlying heart work to redefine the we in a way that was fully inclusive, which has been brought up um, and, and I think is an incredibly important part of this story. But the point is that we have the ability to shape the future. That is the story of the, of the progressives. Not that they did everything right, not that we should emulate everything that they did, but the one thing that we should emulate is not to give in to the despair of feeling that we are determined by forces beyond our control. On the contrary, we can respond to huge forces in whatever way we choose. And whether we end up moving into another upswing largely depends upon whether the young people who inherited this mess, didn't cause it, but inherited it, will choose mastery over drift. 
And I think it's our job to hold up a, a historical story to just say it's possible. We've been here once before. We got out of this mess once before. There are important lessons from the past. There are a lot of things that, that are uncertain about the future and problems that we've never solved, not even close as a nation. Let's get in there and do it. And I think the other lesson that I'll just leave you with is it's easy to think that the solution to big national problems is big national programs. And the Biden administration is definitely on the right track, we believe, with what they're trying to do uh, with those big national programs. But if the civil rights movement and the civil rights legislation is any sort of lesson, we cannot legislate our way into a we. We have to do that work on a heart level. And, and that was true of the progressive era. Don't forget, the progressive era was not just about big national programs. It was about a moral and cultural shift in who we believed we were and what we understood the power of we to be. That is what we're hoping for today. We think it's possible and we just wanna leave you with that hopeful message. Thank you very much, Bob and Shailene for bringing some optimism, hope and inspiration to Wayne State's virtual campus today in the middle of the pandemic. If there is a university in Michigan to have a discussion, productive discussion about communitarian ethos, I certainly think that university is Wayne State, but I'm also biased. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. It was great to have you today. And as they say, until next time. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thanks very much to all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.